because I know that I probably, sometime or the other, I know I've preached on it before, but I can't. Oh. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> Are you glad to be here this morning? Yeah. Everybody? Yeah, I am too. Um. As I said before, this probably is a sermon that you've heard before, but every time it gets to be this time of year, it's something that I always go back to. <coughs> you know what? Alan said a little bit ago, Easter is two weeks away. Now, how is that coming so fast? But it's early this year, and so we find ourselves in that time of year, or at least I do, don't we, that we start thinking about what Easter, oh, Easter's coming, and when we start thinking about Easter, we start thinking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And um, I almost think that a person could probably look into the things of the resurrection, say maybe one-third of the year, look into what Jesus did at the cross by shedding his blood and what he bought for us for a third of the year and then the other little things just pick or the other months just pick up things that's how important this is to us and so when I start looking at the resurrection and what it means to us I have to start a little bit early I like that song we th sang this morning when we all get to heaven now you've heard that song before right when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We'll all see Jesus and how's it go from there? Sing and shout the victory. But you know what? As we're singing that song, I got to thinking, what's going to happen before we all get to heaven? One thing that we know for sure, unless the rapture comes before that time, is that to get to heaven, we all got to die. Right? And that's one thing we don't like to talk about. Well, this morning I want to talk to you or go take you to uh, the Gospel of John chapter 11. And, and we're going to discuss a guy who did die. But he was only dead for just a little while. And everybody knows his name was Lazarus, right? And we would call this Lazarus or Lazarus being raised from the dead. And it takes up almost the whole chapter. Now, I want to ask how many of you out here is this is the first time that you have ever heard anything about Lazarus? Raise your hand. Okay, so you've all heard about Lazarus before and you say, well, why are you going there again? Well, the reason I'm going there again is because it's something that it makes a difference to me. How I look at my life and my death and it make, makes a difference to you, right? That's right. <coughs> Now, we don't get up every morning, any of us, and think, well, this may be the d day that I'm going to die. But if we're facing that, or someone in our family is facing that, or someone that we know is facing that, let's say someone that is very sick, they don't know every day, when is my last day going to be? Amen? And we need to be able, at least they should know, and we need to be able to comfort them it, or with the fact of what the word says about those people or us and we are those people because someday each and every one of us here is going to do one thing remember what your mom always said or what you heard when you was a kid I remember how smart I thought I was when I was about nine years old when I learned there's only two things in life you ever got to do that's what pay taxes. pay taxes what's the other one die pay taxes and die I don't know that I was ever stupid enough to say that to my mother but I know I, I, I quickly learned there's more than two things I got to do in my life amen but um, <clears throat> this comes to us at a time when Lazarus when when we learn about this account of Lazarus it, it <coughs> happened just before um, Jesus, yeah, Bob's going to bring me a medicated halls, right? Cough drop? Well, you can call it, <laughs> Take it till it's all gone. Okay, thank you. you call me in the morning. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I don't know why, but every time I take a deep breath and it's just, you know, it's just, I can feel that tickle in there and I want to <clears throat> cough, although I haven't really been coughing that much. Amanda and the kids stayed this week and, and um, so there's been, I always seem to pick up some germs somewhere, but... Um, now, I lost my train of thought, so I'm just going to get on here to uh, the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John and the man they called Lazarus. And the Bible says that Lazarus was sick. And Lazarus was from Bethany, which was a town about a mile and a half from Jerusalem, and it was the town of Martha and Mary where they lived. He had two sisters. As I just said, Martha and Mary, and you've heard of them frequently mentioned in the Bible. This family, Lazarus and Mar Martha and Mary, were very close to Jesus because he was in tune to them in, in, in their lives and in their, in their feelings and knowledge of their families and the things and, uh, that they did. So the, the sisters, it says, number one, Lazarus, Lazarus was sick. So Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick and they called him the one that you love or the one that you love is sick this the gospel of John chapter 11 so they sent word to Jesus that their brother was sick and um, then we see and we're going to read chapter 11 verse 4 what Jesus' response was okay wherever Jesus was Martha and Mary knew where he was so they sent some kind of messenger some way to get the word to him Lazarus is sick. Now they had complete and utter confidence in the fact and they believed that once Jesus got that word he would immediately come to them and heal Lazarus. Now when Jesus, it says when Jesus heard that, that or heard what, that he was sick, he said this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And so um, Jesus is saying here that Lazarus is not going to die. That's basically what he's saying. And that this, whatever is happening, I know about it. And there's another side of to what is going on than actually what you see. You understand what I'm saying? How many know that this visual world that we live in there's a lot more going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm, right? I talked to Andrew this morning, and Andrew was saying something about, well, I could hear this, but I couldn't see it. And it wasn't visual enough for me. I'm a visual person. <coughs> and we are, aren't we? We only look sometimes at what we see. But Jesus was saying... That whatever is happening is to glorify God and it is to glorify me. Or glorify the Son of God or that he might be glorified thereby. The Bible says that Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Yet he stayed two days. Now if you picked up the phone this morning. And you called me and you said, Terry, old Bob Landers is sick and he needs for you to come and see him. And I sat there for two days. What would you be thinking? When we look at this account, we've got to look at it from, from two or three different perspectives. Number one, what was the perspective of Jesus what was the perspective of the disciples? What did they see? But what also was the perspective of Martha and Mary, who had sent a messenger to Jesus that their brother, who they loved very much, was sick, and it, and it sounded like he was so sick that they thought he was going to die, and they were there at home waiting for Jesus to come. And he sat there for two days, and then after two days, he looked at his disciples, and he said, let us go into Judea again. The disciples immediately stood up and said, yeah, but when you were there, they sought to stone you. And you're going back. And I just want to give you a few verses out of 
chapter 10 <coughs> that um, talks about what they were, or it's going to explain what they were talking about. Because here he was in this place, wherever he was, and where he was was beyond the Jordan River or close to the Jordan River. He had left Judea, and the reason he, that Jesus had left Judea and went to this place is because the Jews were trying to stone him. Well, why were they trying to stone him? And I just got a few verses picked out of chapter 10, which is the chapter immediately before chapter 11, just to show you some of the promises that we can get even out of this chapter for which reason was one of the reasons why they hated Jesus so much. Now, I want you to look here at what he said in... Um, uh, verse 10 of chapter 10. You've heard this before. Quote, this Jesus says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And that good news there. Look what he says in verse 19. Or what it says. There was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He has a devil. And he is mad. And why are you listening to him? Why hear ye him? And others said, there are, uh, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? But see, because of Jesus' teaching and the Jews' disagreement with him, they had a real problem with him. And their problem that they had with him was a, a big enough a problem in their eyes that they were re ready to stone him, that they were going to stone him. But look at these promises that he gives us in... in um, Verses 27, 28, and 29. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and I give unto them, what? And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Isn't that a good thing to know? Amen. When you're a Christian, isn't it good to know that nobody can pluck you out of Jesus' hand? It, nobody. No, but then I also like verse 29, and he said, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. If you think I'm not strong enough, well, then let me tell you who my Father is. Do you think he can pluck you out of my Father's hand? See, we got a double protection there. We can't lose. But these are some of the things for which they wanted to stone Jesus for because in verse 39 it says, Therefore they saw again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went away again beyond the Jordan into a place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And that's where he was with his disciples, beyond the Jordan. When somebody came to him and said, Lazarus, Lazarus is sick. But why did he wait two days? Why did he wait two days? Well, we have some kind of clue that he knew all about this to begin with, right? Because he said, this isn't unto death. This is un isn't unto the death, but uh, for the glory of God. Chapter 11, then, on verse 11. He says to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now, I want you to take a look at that in a different view, maybe than from where you've had before, from what you've had before. Because there is so much that we don't know about death itself. And that is the fear that we have, even though we are believers. No one wants to die, right? No one wants to. Nobody is ready to. We don't want to lose anybody. But yet, it is so much a fact of our life, just like paying those taxes. But what Jesus says here is, I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And I was thinking about that when I was looking at this last night. And for the first time, I was thinking what it would be like. How many know when you're asleep, you're what? You're asleep, right? You don't know what's going on. And it seems like the very simple truth here is that 
at a time in our life when, when death does overtake us, when we wake up, who is going to be waking us up out of our sleep? Jesus, right? Because Jesus said, I'm going to wake him up out of sleep. So many times I've thought, and you know, we know so much about heaven, but we know so little, right? We don't know it all. We don't understand it all. And I thought sometimes, well, when I get up there and I, and I am in heaven, who is the first person I'm going to see? Is it going to be my family? Is it going to be my mother? Is it going to be this person? But you know what? I was thinking right now, or last night, you know what? When I awake out of that sleep, it's going to be Jesus that wakes me up. And whoever I'm going to see after that, then I'm going to be ready to see them all. I'm going to be ready to meet my friends and family, but I'm going to see Jesus first, right? So Jesus says, I'm going to go and I'm going to wake Lazarus out of sleep. And the disciples thought, that's really good. He's, he's sleeping. I'm glad he can rest. You know, if you're sick. And you call and say, well, can I talk to Kevin? Well, he's been sick, but he's sleeping. You're going to say, good. He needs his rest. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They said, well, good, because if he's sleeping, then he's resting, and that's good for him. He, they did not understand when they said that, that Jesus really meant that Lazarus is dead. And so he made it very clear to them. He plainly spoke in verse 14. He said, he said unto the disciples, okay, he's not sleeping. Lazarus is dead dead. Then he tells them something in verse 15 that he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. So he waited two days. He knows that Lazarus has died, but then he says to his disciples, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there so that you might believe. Right? To the intent that you may be the, believe, but we're going to go ahead, he says, and we're going to go. And I, want, I wanted to give you just a reminder this morning, <coughs> real quick. Remember a few weeks ago when we talked about Peter and how Peter had denied Jesus and said, you're going to deny me? And Peter said what? Oh, not me, even though everybody else will deny you. Not me, the great and wonderful Peter. I will never deny you. And then what happened? Peter denied him. Well, verse 16, and I didn't, don't even go there, but it's kind of funny. I want to read it to you. It's not funny because uh, Jesus said, see, the disciples were worried. They did not want him to go to up to where Lazarus was because the last time he had been in that area, they had tried to stone him. That's why he left. They're saying, you can't go back. Jesus waited two days, and he says, come on, we're going. And um, so then in verse 16, it says, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Now, see, we look at Peter, and Peter says, Hey, I'll never deny you, though everyone else denies you. And now here's Thomas. We don't think too much about Thomas, do we? And here's Thomas, and he's standing up and he's saying, all right then, let us go that we all also may die with him. You know what? I got to think, and one of the last things that Jesus said to them in the Garden of Gethsemane is the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many know that to be true? I do. I do. And when I know that my Lord knows how, how willing my spirit is, he also knows how weak my flesh is. And that's something that I think that we need to know, that we need to take into consideration. When we feel that we've fallen just a little bit short of what we expected out of our own selves, you know, when you disappoint God or you feel like you've disappointed Him in some way, you've really disappointed yourself. Right? Because you're thinking to yourself, I meant to do this. I meant to do this good. And yet, why was my flesh so weak? And so, um, I'm glad for your sakes to the intent that you may believe. And I want you to stop and just take this, time, this point in time. And um, I, I would just kind of say like, meanwhile, back at home. Right? Do you know what I mean? Meanwhile, back at home, 
because we had two ladies, right? Martha and Mary. And you know what had happened to them? They waited. They trusted. They had no doubt that Jesus would be there and that he would heal their brother, right? And they waited. You ever wait for somebody? I mean, really wait for somebody. How many of you, raise your hands, are patient waiters? Oh, you guys are lying right here in God's house. Are you a patient waiter? Patient waiter? Uh-huh. To a degree, yes. Two, well, good for you. I'm not. You know, you ever look out the window and think any minute they're going to come? Any minute, any minute, any minute. <coughs> they waited for Jesus to come. And they watched their brother die. And he didn't come. And could they understand why he didn't even come? And what must have been going through their heart? You know, to lose your brother, you're going to have severe grief. And then on top of that, that the Lord Jesus didn't come. When they knew where he was, because they had sent someone to give him the message, so they knew he was close enough that he could have made it. Why didn't he come? Huh? Upset. Yeah. Can you imagine what it would have been like in that day if they would have had cell phones? There's Thomas. And Mary called him. And she said, Oh, Thomas, Lazarus is dead. He's dead. Oh, and Jesus didn't come. And Thomas said, Hey, no, he didn't come. We're still here. We just kind of been taking it easy the last couple days. <coughs> and she'd say, but why? Why? Why didn't he come? Why didn't he come when we sent the messengers? Maybe Thomas said, well, I don't know, but he said he's glad he's not there. <laughs> to the intent that we might believe. I don't know what he means, but he's saying that's what he's glad he wasn't there. Right? We don't know everything that goes on, right? But you know what? Sometimes in our lives, those sort of things happen. Cell phones don't always... <coughs> because of them, we don't get an opportunity sometimes to evaluate what's happening or to think it out in our own life, right? I mean, we already got the answer before the question has ever come. But... Nonetheless, to lay all joking aside, Martha and Mary had broken hearts. And they wondered, where was Jesus? When we needed him the most, why didn't he come? Jesus... Maybe Thomas said, don't worry, he's leaving right now. He'll be there in a little bit. Hang on. Martha and Mary could only say it's too late. It's too late. Verse 17 says, then when Jesus did get there, he found that he had lain in the grave how many days? Four days. Lazarus was in the grave. <coughs> Four days. And when the word got to Martha that Jesus was there, or with a short distance of their place, it says she ran to him. And the first thing she did was she ran to him with a, and here's what she said, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. How many of us think that we would do the same thing in that situation? I think we probably would. But can you imagine almost how that would have had to feel to, to Jesus. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died, but you're four days late. Right? You're four days late. There's nothing you can do now. 
All hope is gone. Lazarus is dead. But then in verse 22, she says something that I think we need if, if we could remember this, just like, and you know what? Sometimes we say things that we don't know are going to uh, reach out to people and that they can see for the first time. Because I'm not kidding you, last Sunday night when Charles <coughs> said that little phrase, I would heard it before, but I never heard it before like I did last Sunday night. Don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big your God is. And I've seen it from a new light that I'm going to start speaking to my problems. I'm going to start speaking to my problems. I'm going to tell my problem. Bob, if it's a back problem. Back. You may be hurt now, but you don't know my Lord. You don't know my God. You don't know how powerful he is. You don't know how strong he is. And his word says you got to go. You know, pain, you got to go. But... I know that even now, this is what Mary said to Jesus, e, I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. <coughs> Jesus, you weren't here. You are four days late. Lazarus was dead. If you would have been here, he would not have died. But I know... That whatever you ask of God, God will give it to thee. And that's another new thing that I know, but it's a new thing I want to remember. Because when we go to, when we ask God, and we ask God in Jesus' name, this insinuates here that she's telling Jesus, Jesus, whatever you ask of God, that's what he will give it to you. And so, you know what? There might be some times I might change the way I pray and say, Jesus, will you ask your Father? Because he says we don't have to do that. But you know what? Whatever she says. And you know what? He didn't deny it. Jesus didn't deny it. Everything that even I know that even now, whatsoever you ask of God, that way he'll do. I want to look just real quick at Martha's confession because it's like ours, Right? See, you think that everybody in the Bible had it all together or didn't have it all together. But it's kind of like ours or like mine or much like ours. Because their faith was intermingled with fact, right? The fact, the fact Lazarus, or Lazarus is dead. Her faith had told her that if he would have been there, he could have healed Lazarus. Okay? But... What she was looking in now, how many know? We look at the moment that we are in. It is what it is. Have you noticed that's kind of a new phrase? And it is one that I have picked up. It is what it is. Right? I don't know how. You know, back in the 60s when you had them little slangs, you know, well, this is kind of like groovy. Do you remember that? Huh? Groovy. Remember groovy? It was a new word, right? <laughs> My dad didn't like that word. Don't say that word. Why not? What's wrong with groovy? And I've noticed people, and I've noticed I've been saying it myself, and if I'm talking to Kevin, let's say I'm talking to him about a situation. You know, whatever it could be. And Oh, let's say if it was like, well, you know, we got that old car out there, and maybe we need to get a new one, and maybe we don't have money. Well, listen. It is what it is. We'll deal with it as we have to deal with it. And we, we're hearing that, and I'm picking up that attitude that things, it is what it is. Right? Here we are in Indiana. And it is what it is. It is what it is. But you know what? We need to change that. Because it isn't always what it seems to be, is it? It is what it is on the surface. But that's only what we can see. It's the things that we can't see that we don't grab a hold of. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, um, Martha's confession, you are the Son of God. You, um, I believe that God will give you anything you ask of Him versus Lazarus is dead. It is what it is. There's nothing that can be done about it. But 
I think we need to look at that sometime that we're a lot like that. Have you ever said to Jesus if you would have intervened? No, you say I would never have said that. Maybe you thought it then in your mind, in your heart. Somewhere, Lord, I, I can remember asking you for this. I can remember mentioning this to you. And you haven't done anything about it yet. And it's too late now. It's too late to change things. Because it is what it is. But, I know that whatever you ask of God, He'll give it to you. And maybe we should learn to tack that on there to some of our things. Verse 23, you know what Jesus' response was to Martha? When she ran to Him in her grief, in her pain, her brother was dead. Her brother, two things. Her brother was dead and Jesus didn't care enough to come on time. Hey, kind of seems like it is what it is, right? We're going to say that. Verse um, 23, what Jesus said to her, Jesus saying to her, <clears throat> Okay, where does he get this stuff? Where does Jesus get this stuff? Thy brother shall rise again. Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the re resurrection of the last day. Verses 25 and 26, and you've heard this before. Listen, it's not a new thing that you've heard this morning. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He was asking Martha, believest thou this? But he asked you that same question this morning. He will ask it to you every day that you have a conversation with him until that day when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. We'll all see Jesus. I am the resurrection and I am the life. And he that believes in me, though he were dead. See, he doesn't that take it away. It is a process that we have to go through. It's one that we fear and that nobody wants to go through. But when we do, he says, yet shall you live. So though you were dead, yet shall ye live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You shall never die. So you know that this death that is going to take this death that is going to take you out of this world and take me out of this world is death only as we see it. But it's really life. Right? That's what he's saying. It's hard to understand because we can't see it and we'll never know until we get there. Right? But when we are gone we are only gone on. Right? We're not really gone. Only far as you can see. If I am to die, to die today and you look at my body, you're going to say she's deader than a doornail. Right? Right? But you'll know that it's only what you can see. It is what it is, but then it isn't what it always seems like. You know, there's more. When Jesus said that to Mary, verse 27, here, or Martha, here was her response. She said, Yeah, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And that's all it takes. That you have belief, that you have faith in Him as the Son of God. So Martha had this conversation with Jesus, and then Martha ran back and got Mary, and he had the same conversation with Mary. Because Mary was in the house crying. Oh, no, no. She wasn't just in the house crying. She was in the house pouting. Right? These two sisters, it was Mary's brother just as much as it was Martha's. And when they heard that Jesus was on his way and that he was near, Martha got up and she ran to him. And Mary closed the door and sat in the corner like this. Huh? The Martha 
goes and gets Mary and says, Jesus is here and he wants you to come. He wants to talk to you. And it says when she got there, she threw, she threw herself down at his feet and cried. And she said, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus just said what? Show me the grave. Show me the grave. Says that he, they took him to the place where Lazarus was buried. And it wasn't a grave like we think now. We think of the graveyards, but it was more like a cave that they had put him in with a large, large stone, uh, you know, covering the entrance to that cave. And when they got there, Jesus said uh, to those around him, those disciples that had followed him, those disciples that probably wondered what was even going on, and they'd probably been thinking it for a long time because Jesus had very clearly told them that this sickness is not unto death, but that the glory of the Lord should would re be revealed. He said, take away the stone. And Martha, I like Martha because she's kind of, she's kind of, you know, she says what she's thinking. Lord, by this time he stinks. I know you didn't know that, Lord. I know you didn't know that. But have you thought of this? I mean, I had total and complete faith that if you would have been here, you could have healed him, but you weren't. So what's going on? I don't know. But Lord, you want us to roll away the stone, but Lord, don't you understand he's been dead four days? And he stinks by now. And he turned and looked at her, and this is what he said, verse 40. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. Now, are we able to see the glory of God today in our lives? Yes, we are. But we have to look beyond it is what it is. Right? We have to look beyond that. And, and Jesus said, and just stood right there and he shouted out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And verse 44 says, And then he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with great clothes. His face was bound with a napkin. Loose him and let him go. Lazarus was alive. What has all this got to do with me? What, you know, in... You've heard it before. Why do I need to hear it again? Well, I needed to hear it again. Maybe I just needed to preach it again. Maybe I just needed to remind you. Maybe you just need to, to be reminded of just exactly what this means to you. Amen. Because next week, is, we're going to have Palm Sunday. We're going to look at, 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 you know, we look at Jesus going into Jerusalem, all the things that he suffered, that he died on the cross, that he shed his blood, that he was put in the grave, that he rose again in three days. And we look at all of that, and we believe all of that, and we know all of that. And that's about our Lord. And that is all right, and that is all good. But here, one week before all of that happened, Jesus raises his beloved friend Lazarus from the dead to show you that that rising from the dead wasn't just for Jesus. It was for all of us. Now, it's for all of us. It's for all of us. What does it mean to you? What does the... What, what does it make a difference whether you believe that Jesus rose from the dead or not? Does it make a difference? Well, in Corinthians, Paul says that if you don't believe he rose again, then your faith is worth nothing. He says that if in this life alone, if in this life right now, all alone or only we have hope, then we are of most men miserable. Right? Because we, we have to have that faith that he rose again because he says over and over and over, if I rise again... You will rise again. Lazarus was risen again. Jesus did that for an example to us. That, it, that yes, he was risen again. He's the son of God. But he has the power to raise us up again. 
Amen. And we won't, we can only believe that. We don't, we don't know it. We can't see it. But we have to believe that it's going to happen. He said to her, do you believe if I say to you, what do you think when I say to you? See, even Jesus had a hard time getting her, Martha and Mary, to not to believe it. It's just something our mind cannot comprehend. Right? Thy brother shall rise again. Oh, I like this one. You know what? Um, our friend Lazarus, is asleep. But I'm going to go and wake him up. Out of sleep. See, we can do that in our own life, right? Can we do that for others? And you say, well, this is kind of a, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm closing. I am. What's that mean? I am really. Just think. Serious. What does it mean to you? When you think of that, what does it mean to you? Do you, have you, placed all your trust in the fact of these comments that Jesus Christ made because you live, or because I live, you will live also. He said in John 14, because I live, you will live also. Because you live, or because I live, you will live also. And how many people do you know that have gone before us? That that was where you could get your comfort, right? Knowing the fact and what he said. If you believe in me, and if I am the resurrection in, and I am the life, anyone that believes in me shall never die but have eternal life, right? That's our hope. That's our hope. It's our hope today. It's our hope tomorrow. It's, it was our hope two years ago or three years ago or 20 years ago. Or even then when we didn't believe it 20 years ago, it's our hope now for people in our family, right? Don't we look forward? Hey, we look forward to that day when we all get to heaven, right? What a day of rejoicing that will be. We will all see Jesus. <laughs> okay, we know it. We're going to shout the victory. We're going to see Jesus. I think I'm going to see him first. Because I think he's going to say, hey, I, I'm going to go and wake Terry out of sleep. And that, that's the first face I'm, face I'm going to be seeing. But there's others there, isn't there? We have mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and family and loved ones. This Easter... We have to be able to see in our spiritual eyes when we look at the cross and we look at the, in our faith that Jesus Christ rose again and we believe that, then we believe also that we will rise again. Right? We do. Amen? Amen. Okay. You can stand. Oh, someday they're going to say that. They're going to say that about you. Or no, Jesus is going to say that about you. My friend, Kevin sleeps, but i go got to wake him out of sleep. My friend, Terry sleeps, but I'm going to wake her out of sleep. My friend, Belle sleeps. All of us, if we're in Christ, Jesus is going to wake us out of sleep. Now, sleeping ain't so bad, right? We like that. I do. I just want to, as I close, I, I feel like I didn't give this, this, what I want you to get to the depth of what my heart says that I want. Because in the next 
couple of weeks as, as we just are getting into these days, this, this holy day that is coming up, the, the promise is for us. The proof is in Him. That's it. He did that. See, He could have went to the cross and shed His blood for us that our, our, our sins would be forg forgiven and then not risen from the dead to, for us to know. He was seen. Do you know how many times He was seen? Maybe we'll look at that next week. He was seen, Jesus was, as proof to you. See, He proved it to you that He rose again and He had to because He had said to you, I will rise again, and if I live again, you will live also. Amen? Bill, would you come up real quick? Not Bill, Bob, and let us pray for your back.